Okay. So yes, as I said in the email, Parshas Zahor is our is our topic. Um, you know, last year when we hit Parshas Beshalach, so we had a shear about Amalek and went through the unique nature of war with Amalek. Why is Amalek different from everybody else? Uh, with the different rules for their for their war, we talked about whether Amalek can be rehabilitated and the ideas of the Rambam, of Cook, and so on. And um, if anyone, for some reason, doesn't remember that from last year, um, so I gave you two links at the top of the page. One of them is our shear about war with Amalek that we did last year. Uh, and then the other one is the same topic in a little bit more depth than we did it last year um, from my Shmuel Shear, because the Shmuel Shear up north is actually in this parak now. It's in the War with Amalek from Sefer Shmuel. So I did a little bit more in depth with them. So if anyone wants a refresher on the whole issue of our fight with Amalek, just go to those links and you will have it. Uh, but what I wanted to do today is to look specifically at the war that's recorded in the Haftorah for Zahar, Shaul's war against Amalek, and in particular, one piece of it which um, I don't hear people ask about, but everybody should. Classically, what are the two mistakes that everybody attributes to Shaul in this war with Amalek? He didn't kill them all out. But did, what, what, was, what was missing? He kept them alive. The best animals were kept for Carbonos and the king or somebody. The king. Yeah. Agak. King Agak. He spares King Agak. So everybody knows, I think, that um, we can come up with rationales for sparing the best animals. Either Mishma, right? You're sincere. You want to bring them as Carbonos to Hashem. Thank him for success in the war. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is they wanted spoils from the battle, and you know it's sort of undercover of, oh, these are going to be for God. But why in the world would Shaul spare Agag? What's the logic, right? You just fought a war against these people. You want to destroy them. They're your enemy, and they are through Tanakh. Amalek is forever at our throats. Why would Shaul spare Agag? It doesn't make any sense. What kind of motivation could you come up with to explain that? And that's a question which I, I have been leaning Zahor um, every year since my bar mitzvah. Like that's, mm-hmm. That was my bar mitzvah thing. And whether a bar mitzvah boy should do Zahor or not, I did. Um, so like, I, I've known this Zahor for a very long time, and it wasn't until this year that I asked myself, wait, but that part of the story doesn't make any sense. What are, you, what are you sparing a God for? So that's what I wanted to look at. Now, that's going to require that we go through the basic story just to understand what happened. So that's going to be like the bulk, just like getting through the story. Then we have four questions we're going to ask. I tried something different um, this time on the source sheet, and I hope no one's insulted by it. The, um, it's an option for those who want it. After, number, after source number nine, we're going to have four questions that we're going to ask. And I... The, um, that wasn't for me. I didn't ask, I didn't ask Donnie to put out pencils, but I just felt like, you know what? Maybe it's a good idea that if people want to, no one has to. I'm not looking to see who fills it out. And I'm not collecting the sheets for grading, but but just as a way to to like I, I'm I've become convinced over the years that um, that in order for adult education to be meaningful, you have to incorporate some of the things that we do to make education more serious. That's like the review questions at the end and that yeah. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think that that it's an option there for those who want to do it. I'm not looking to see who does and who doesn't. Um, but um, once we have our basic questions, then we're going to look at why war with Amalek is different, and then how this fits with what Shoal decided to do, why he spared Agak, and why it was wrong for him to do so. And then why Shmuel killed him in the end, because Shoal doesn't kill him, Shmuel kills him. And then, at the very end, God willing we get that far, but if you look at the last page... You will see something truly remarkable. Saw that. Uh, wasn't that really something? The, um, so I'll explain when we get there. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't want to tell you before the end. So you'll see. Is that Adolf's wife? Yes. So it's like, oh my gosh, I've got comparison. So we'll see. So um, the basic story. The, the, the basic story. At this stage, when the Jews are supposed to fight the war against Amalek, Shaul is the king. The nation had wanted a king who would establish the law himself. 
That was back in Perakhet in Shmuel. Um, Hashem countered by appointing a king who was supposed to follow Hashem's instructions instead via Nevoah, via prophecy. Shaul has already by this time made one major mistake in the book. There are a couple of things here that he gets dinged for, but one in particular was that there was a war against the Plishtim, and the Plishtim were about to attack, and Shaul was supposed to wait for Shmuel and have Shmuel come bring Karbanos, and Shaul panicked, and he brought the Karbanos instead. And he gets in trouble for that. And Shmuel actually says to him, at this point, monarchy is gone from your descendants. Meaning, you're not going to pass it along to your descendants. That's the way that various commentators understand the punishment given to Shmuel, given to Shaul by Shmuel. Hashem then sends Shmuel right after that and says to Shaul, wage war against Amalek. And that's where we pick up. So if you take a look on the sheet, the English translations are all the JPS 1985 translation. I changed like one word because I wanted to, but yeah. Vayomer Shmuel el Shaul. Shmuel says to Shaul, Osi shalach Hashem l'mshachachal melech Hashem sent me to anoint you as king over his nation, over Israel. So listen to the words of Hashem. So declares Hashem. I remember what Amalek did to the Jews, how they laid in wait for them on the road when the Jews came out of Egypt, right? Remember, this story is right after Yamsuf. We, we, we haven't gone anywhere, we haven't done anything, we're on a threat to anybody. We're just out there in the Midbar, we haven't even gone to our Sina yet. Now go strike Amalek, destroy everything he has, have no mercy, you shall kill everyone. Man, woman, child, animals, the whole bit. And we discussed already last year, you know, this, um, this business and why he has to destroy everything. Radak had said it's about eliminating the memory of Amalek entirely. Barbanel says that you're destroying the animals because you want to show this is not a war for conquest or self-enrichment. So I'm not taking anything from the, uh, from the battle. It's complete and total destruction. Okay, source number two. Shaul rallies the nation. He counts them up. He counts them up, Batilaim. They translate it here as though Tlaim is a place. And that's one way to look at it. The Gemara assumes that, no, he counted them with sheep, meaning you don't count individual Jews. The Torah says that you're not supposed to. The Torah says that we are supposed to be innumerable. So, therefore, he gives everybody a sheep and then counts up the sheep. Counting sheep is a thing. So... Um, <laughs> There are, there are 200,000 fighters, there are 10,000 from Yehuda. The breakout of Yehuda as being separate is fascinating, but not for right now. Shoal comes to Amalek, and then, by the way, he tells the Kani, get out of the way, I don't want you to get into trouble. There's a whole other discussion about who the Kani are, Yisro's descendants, are they Jewish, are they not Jewish, also not for our discussion right now, because otherwise we'll never get anywhere. The, um, the Kani go away. Shaul strikes Amalek from Chavilah to Shur. This is an area in the Negev, in the south. And you know that, because it says to you, Asher al Mitzrayim. It's by Egypt. And then Pasuk Chet. But he supposes Agag Melech Amalek Chai. He captures Agag, king of Amalek, alive, and destroys everybody else. And Shaul and the nation spare Agag, as well as the best of the sheep, the cattle, and the, uh, all the good stuff that they didn't want to destroy. But anything that was lowly, cheap and worthless, as the JPS translates it, that they're okay getting rid of. Okay, they only, only save the best. Clear so far? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hashem then speaks to Shmuel. Shmuel, who ostensibly wasn't there to see everything that happened. Right? Shmuel wasn't at the battlefield. He gave instructions to Shaul. Shaul went and did what he was supposed to do, or didn't do what he was supposed to do. Fine. So, in source number three, Hashem speaks to Shmuel and he says, I regret having made Shaul king. He didn't follow what he was supposed to do. Shav me'acharai. He turned away from me. He did not fulfill my words. Shmuel is angry. They translate here as distressed, which is cute. Vayichar. Vayichar. Haronaf, right? It's funny that nechamti is a negative word because nechama is comfort. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, the, the, I don't think those words are unrelated. Meaning, we use the term nun chet mem to refer to consolation, and we also use it to refer to recanting or regretting, I think because they're both change of mind. 
right? Somebody who was suffering and now they feel better, so they're comforted. Somebody who was going to do X and then decided to do Y also had a change of heart, a change of mind. In general, the word is actually fascinating within this Haftarah. We're not going to go into it, but it's another thing to think about. How here, Hashem says, Nichamti, right? I regret having made Shaul king. And then, after the verdict is in, and Shaul wants to appeal it, Shmuel says to him, Lo ben adam hu lehinachem. God isn't a human being such that he's going to change his mind. What do you mean? He just did. <laughs> like, you know, how do you reconcile that? That's its own discussion. I mean, there's so much here in this half Torah. If anybody's really interested and doesn't want to make it up to Thornhill at 1.30 on Thursdays, then I can send you the link so you can, you know, download the Shira. But, like, there's a lot going on in this parak. Um, but, yeah, I told Alina not to bother coming down for the Shira because she's going to hear this eventually when we get up to This is actually a little ahead of where we are on the Thursday Shira, Thursday afternoon one. So... He says, I've changed my mind about Shaul. Now, God doesn't really change his mind, right? It means that God expresses a behavior which is counter to what he had done before. Before he made Shaul king, now he is unmaking Shaul as king. And that's the concept of regret. It means I'm changing course. The, uh, and he says, I'm done. Shmuel is very upset, and he cries to Hashem all night, which is fascinating. Right? Think about what that means. Was Shmuel happy about having a king in the first place? No. No. Shmuel was not happy about having a king. Shmuel thought that this was horrible, that it's a rejection of him, it's a rejection of God. The, uh, he thought it was a terrible thing. But now... Now he's staying up all night, so... Yeah. yeah he's, he's staying up all night, crying to God about, about this. Yeah. So, Arbanel says something, which I think is very on, uh, I think it's spot on. He says, Shaul is Shmuel's handiwork. Shmuel took him out of nowhere. He was a nothing. He was part of this small tribe, degraded tribe, Binyamin. Um, he himself said, we have no political power, we're not a large family, we're not people of great means. Didn't want to be king. He was shy. He hid when they tried to anoint him in front of everybody. And Shmuel coached him and brought him into a position of power, set him up for success, and he did it. blew it. And, and Shmuel is heartbroken. And especially when you add a layer to that, the story of Shmuel's kids. Right? Shmuel wanted his kids to take over for him as judges, and the nation came to him and said, they're not following in your ways. That was right before they asked for a king. That's part of the request, really, for a, for a king. This is all Shmuel has. Right. This is his legacy. This is all the guy who spent literally his whole life as a servant of the nation. Right? His mother dedicated him to go to the Mishkan. He would weave off to the Mishkan. You go, and his whole life has been service. He didn't even live at home much. He has a circuit system where he travels around judging people. Like the um, this is all he has, and now that's gone. So he is just heartbroken. Is it 100 percent clear that he had no idea about? Shaul's decision to keep Anag alive? So, I think the evidence is he doesn't know. I'm going to make that argument as we go through the text that I think it's clear he doesn't know. But what's particularly fascinating about what you're asking, Abarbanel makes the point here, Hashem didn't tell him. All Hashem said was, he didn't do what I told him to do. Hashem doesn't say what? So how do we know that those are his mistakes? Well, how do we know? You'll yeah, see. But it's a pretty known thing when the king is remained alive. I'm sure they put it... It's not he's not even there. there. He hasn't seen Shaul. We know he's not with Shaul, because you're going to see what comes next. He has to go greet him. The, um, in other words, Shmuel isn't, isn't at the battle. Shmuel isn't aware of the sheep. Yeah, I mean, you'll see. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you based on the text. It really seems like Shmuel is unaware of what went wrong. That's the way I would read it. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to support it. Look at, look at what's coming right here, you'll see, in, the, in number four. Shmuel gets up, likrat Shaul, right, to go greet Shaul in the morning. Now, that in and of itself is in proof, right? He could be there at the battle of his own tent, and he gets up to go greet him. That's not proof, but look what happens. Shmuel is told, Shaul has come to the Carmel, he set up a yad, which they translate here as monument. I'll come back to that in a moment. And that he, Shmuel, turned and descended to Gilgal. If Shmuel had been at the battlefield, would he 
not know this? Wouldn't he know Shaul had been in the Carmel, that Shaul had set up the, uh, the monument, that Shaul had gone down to Gilgal? Right? He would be aware. He wouldn't need someone to tell him. That's, that's to me, his most basic evidence that he's not, he, whether Hashem told him or not, certainly he's not physically present. You follow? Mm-hmm. Side note, but an interesting side note. They tell you that Shaul went to Carmel. Where is Carmel? North. Very north. north. Like Kaifa. Like Kaifa north. Where was this war? South. By Egypt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he, cro- he went across country, like, in order to build a monument. That's a really spectacular thing for Shaul to do. So, um, so the simple read would not be Carmel, capital C. It would be Carmel. Carmel is a term that you use for land that produces, you know, fields and growth wine. and, you know, that kind of thing. Not necessarily wine. The, um, but in general, we, we talk about Eretz Carmel. It doesn't mean the Carmel. Mm-hmm. However, the Gemara, it's just funny that JPS capitalized it. The Gemara says, no, it actually was, not the Gemara, it's a Medrash, not, it's not found in the Gemara, says that it actually was Har Carmel. And they link it in this Medrash to Eliyahu when he does his Mizbeach mm-hmm. Har Carmel. It says he repaired a destroyed Mizbeach. It was that Mizbeach that Shaul built the, at Carmel because it says that he built a Yad and the Medrash says the Yad is actually not a monument but a Mizbeach. That's a whole other... But if Shaul is coming to meet Shmuel, I mean, it wouldn't be so crazy for him to travel far. I mean, Shmuel is a very... Shmuel is his master, so to speak. Who said Shaul was coming to meet Shmuel? It sounds like... It's just the opposite. Yeah, if anything... He went to Carmel. To he went to Carmel, he built a monument, and then he went to Gilgal, which is an entirely different yeah, place. Gilgal? He was probably Gilgal. not going to Shmuel any time to do. He didn't want him to know what happened. Uh, maybe he we'll think it was wrong. <laughs> Good. So one of the questions we have to ask is, what is Shaul thinking? Does he think he's done anything wrong? No. But before we get to that, just in terms of geography, yeah, Gilgal, Gilgal is the first place we camped when we entered Israel. It's so right near Yericho. He went with that. Yeah. I'm just thinking he conquered this nation. He's taking the loot. He's taking the king. If you think about, he's dragging him through the streets, proclaiming. Everyone's cheering, excited throughout the entire. Jerusalem and the city of Israel, they're parading, they're excited, and then he's going to make this huge monument in celebration of this. Good. So it's we're going to come back to exactly so, that idea. It's so yeah. ego-based, like he's showing off. Like, so that's look what one, I did, I did such a great thing, look, I conquered the whole nation, I'm keeping right. things. As and Malbim is sort of along those lines. And we're going to come back to it, because what, what you're saying, both of you are saying, is going to be very important within this, within this discussion, is what is Shell's frame of mind? What does he think he has accomplished at this stage? So watch what happens. The, um, whether he built a Mizbeach, or whether he built a monument, or Yad, and some of the commentators say is just a place to divide up the spoils, he then goes to Gilgal. And the commentators are pretty universal that he goes to Gilgal because the Jews always go back to Gilgal, because that's the first place we went when we entered the land. It becomes this very important site. You know, as an American, so I would say like, you know, Philadelphia or Plymouth Rock or something like that. I, I don't know what to do with Canada. <laughs> the, um, wherever Confederation took place or something. I don't know. Um, but that's the, um, it's, it's, it's a powerful place for them. And look what happens. Pasuk Gimel. Shmuel comes to Shaul, not the other way around. And Shaul says to him, blessed are you to God. I've done everything God told me to do. Right. He's so excited. It's cute, mm-hmm. right? The, um, I, I shouldn't say that. It trivializes mm-hmm. it. But Hakimosi es devar Hashem, right? Look at the Hebrew. It's really interesting. Go back to source number three and what Hashem said to Shmuel. Devarai lo heikim Hakimosi es devar Hashem. Same exact language, right? Yeah. I mean, it's being set up that way. And that obviously yeah. happened first, right? Yeah. So Shmuel says to him this great line. Wow. He says, "So why why do I hear sheep? Is that, <laughs> is that, is that sheep? Is that there's also, also this great onomatopoeia going on here, right? In the in the pasuk, right? The um, especially if you if you know how to lane, which I don't know if you do, but the um, you could the but the the um, the wording here, ume kol hatzon hazeh be'aznai." So even if you do it without the trump, right, 
the sound of the sheep in my ears. (laughs) And when you lean it, the note is severe. So he says to him, So it sounds just like it. Yeah, that's what that is. So... Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but it's just like it's so glaring. Yeah. The um, so Shmuel says to Shaul, you know, why do I hear sheep? What do you mean you did what God told you to do? I wasn't clear. I didn't list like every animal should be destroyed. Like, what what did you do? So Shaul says to him, Oh no, it's all good. I brought them from Amalek because the nation, not me, the nation. The nation spared the best of the animals to bring them as a carbon to Hashem and everything else we destroyed. So he justified it. And he's not mentioning that Agag is still alive. He doesn't mention Agag at all. He doesn't mention Agag at all. Oh, he's saying also we're going to use it for carbons. Right. Yes. He has two elements here. Number one, this is a good thing to do. It's a carbon. And number two, it was the nation. The nation. Right? That's that's on that front. But in terms of Agag, he doesn't mention it. And again, Shmuel, I don't think, is aware because he hasn't seen him. He yeah, hasn't heard no. him. How would he know? So watch what happens. Source number five. Shmuel says to Shaul, we need to talk. Heref. Heref is a term that, that basically means hold on, is what it means. It comes from the root, I believe it comes from the root, the word reish pei he, which means to weaken or to be soft, rough at. And there are a lot of but sources you can bring to support it. Means like right. It's like a pause of an eye. Blink. Right. We use it in the blink, but it's like a pause is really what it's like. He's like, he, you know, he's saying, hang on. You can, I can give you examples if you want, like where you can do it, but, but the way Malvin reads it is he's saying, quiet, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he, says, he says, he stop talking, show. I'm going to tell you what Hashem told me last night. And Shaul says, speak. This is very formal, right? The way that he, that he does this. So he says, you know, you may be small in your eyes, but you're the head of all the tribes. Hashem made you the king over Israel. Hashem sent you on this path. And Hashem said to you to destroy Amalek to the blast. And why didn't you listen? Why instead did you take the spoils? That word they use in the English, batad, they translate as to swoop down. It's from the word ayit, which is a bird. So, but ah, you swoop down on the spoils against what Hashem told you to do. So this, this is basically countering his argument that it was not him, but the people that... Right. So it's actually a double point. His first point, his main one, is definitely what Goldie says, which is that it's a response about blaming the nation. You had no business listening to them. You knew what you were supposed to do. Second level, though, is he says you swoop down on the spoils. Don't don't tell me about the nation. This is this is you doing this. And notice that he calls them spoils. He doesn't say carbonos. He's let, you know, let let's call it what it is. I think it's interesting that it says in katona tabeinacha that Shmuel is referring to Shal as you see yourself as very little. So I think he, in fact he might be correct because Shal thinks. I'm really, okay, so I might be a king, but what I did, is it really that so impactful? Okay, so I may have kept the king alive, or, you know, I may have kept those animals alive. What big of a deal is it? Also the fact that he doesn't come from blue blood, so he was a nobody. So I think all of these play a huge role in his actions as a king, Mm -hmm. and not realizing the big impact. Right. No, I think so. I think that there's, I mean, there's a tension as you read this all along of, is Shaul sincere? Or does Shaul think maybe he can minimize the mistake? He recognizes the mistake, but just thinks he can minimize it. Like, where is he? Where is he with this? I'm on the side of thinking he's actually sincere. That he actually thinks what he's done is right. Um, and then, yeah, once he's caught, well, okay, but you know, the nation. You know, kind of but isn't this like a common theme that we we, we learned when we learned Shoftim um, together that that all the Shoftim they like they never really quite finished the job. Mm-hmm. And and maybe even worse than this, specifically, but th- this kept happening. Yes. Right? Like, they kept not quite destroying. They kept thinking, oh, no, we're going to make them our slaves. We're going to, like, move in. We're just going to, like, watch over them and make them do what we want. Right? So this is a similar thing. Like, I feel like they were all doing it, so they did the same thing. Maybe. I don't think I mean, it's so, so, so the first so time that they have a king. 
It's different. It's, it's not so so strange. It also brings out the humanity in people, like telling people to kill out entire nations, entire people. Like that's what differentiates us from the Nazis. Like the point is, it's not such a crazy thing that so the humanity them, creeps up. Right and no, he kept the king probably. So I'm going to come you know, back. Like, it's not so crazy. He couldn't finish the job to kill out a whole. Right. So I'm going to come back to Hindi's question of what is motivating Shaul and is there mercy involved? But I have to tell you, I'm going to agree with what Miriam said. Which yeah. is, yeah. really, if you had to pick someone you were going to spare, it probably would have been a two year old. It wouldn't have been a kid. Another thing that could have been going through his head is that if he kills everybody, like, there's no way to show everyone what he did. Like, just make an announcement. Oh, by the way, there was a nation over there, and I. I don't know, there's a whole bunch out. of corpses. Yeah, they're all, yeah. Like, they're all over there. Like, now I guess, like, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if, if he wanted to. He could have made Yeah, no, they, there's a display he can create. I don't think that that's his issue. Also, but the punishment is so severe. Right. It's really harsh. So the punishment piece of it is not one I'm going to get into in great detail, but we are going to have to talk about it. So let me go a little further with it. I apologize because I'm rushing you through something that's really, you know, shouldn't be rushed. But at the same time, there's so much to see in order to get to the point. So I feel like I do have to rush. I don't know. But there, there are also two elements that are missing from Shmuel's criticism. Number one, he didn't mention Agag, right? He says, all right, I'm going to tell you what God said. And he didn't mention anything about Agag, number one. And number two, he didn't actually say what Hashem said. Right? Hashem said, you're not the king anymore. Shmuel didn't say that here. He said, what in the world did you do? Why did you disobey Hashem? You swooped down on the spoils, and that's it. So look at number six. And Shaul's response to him Vayomer Shaul el Shmuel, Shaul says to Shmuel, I listened to God's voice. I went on the path God sent me, just like you said, I was on God's path, God sent me on a path, I went on that path. And I brought Agag, king of Amalek, and I destroyed Amalek. Notice, I brought Agag back, and I destroyed Amalek. And the nation took the spoils, notice it's the nation, Right? And they did it for karbanos. They did it for offerings for God. By the way, this is probably a good point to note something I forgot to mention before. The first time when they are told, when we're told by the narrator in number two, the end of number two, that they spared the animals, they didn't say anything about karbanos. That was something that Shaul introduced when he was explaining things to, to Shmuel in source number four. But it wasn't there in the original version well, of, true, of what was happening. Actually. So we, we don't know. That's the problem. Right, the narrator just does tell you that they destroyed everything that wasn't worth it. Wasn't yes. Worth yeah. So, Shaul says, I spared Agag, the, um, and, and he just says it as though it's okay. He's just, he's just volunteering that he, that he spared Agag. So what we're going to see is a view that we find in Barbanel, we find it in a couple of others as well, which is that, um, that actually Shaul believes that he spared Agag not in violation of the command, but in fulfillment of the command. Meaning he volunteers this because he actually thinks this is okay. Right. That this is what he was supposed to do, as you'll see. The, um, you can imagine, though, Shmuel like, standing there like, you did what? <laughs> not bad enough about the sheep. You did what? But he couldn't. He couldn't kill him. Yeah, he couldn't. Why, it, why couldn't like he just okay, let's just kill him and let's just eliminate right. the animals? Like, was it a done deal? Boom. So that's one of the things we have to figure out. Good question. Right. Sorry, Andy, you were saying. No, it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So yes, that's one of the questions you have to ask. Why not just? Why not just take care of it now? Right. So why would Hashem want those carbonos, those animals as carbonos? Like, why did he think that was a good idea? What do you mean? We always bring no. carbonos. Yeah, but from other nations, like from we just spoils? had the war with the Plishtim right before this, and they took they from the spoils yeah, and they took they animals, did. and Shaul set up a mizbeach. Uh, yeah, so um, there is precedent, but you're right. It's like Amalek animals. That's gross. Right. But the, um, but take a look at number seven. The way that the commentators read what happened here and why Shmuel didn't finish the point about what Hashem said is that number five was actually Shaul. Number six, I should say, was Shaul interrupting him. You know, as Shmuel started to speak, and he said, what you did was wrong, and you spare them, whatever. And Shaul says, no, I, I did what God told me to do. And now Shmuel gets to finish his thought in number seven. Shmuel says, does Hashem want karbanos, like he wants you to listen to what he told you to do? Listening is better than bringing a good karban. 
That's what he, he says to him. And then he says, rebelling against God is like the sin of sorcery. It's like idolatry. For you to reject the command of God, God's going to reject you as king. That's, the, uh, that, that's where he sort of brings down the hammer on, uh, on Shaul. Two different ways this is taken. There are other ways you can take it, but two basic ways that this is taken is either a carbon is something you bring, at least a chadas anyway, as a makeup for having failed to obey God. Wouldn't it be better if you just obeyed in the first place? That's, that's one way that this is taken. I have to say that doesn't convince me so much. Oh, that's Radak, Ralbag, and Abarbanel, who are some pretty big names. But it doesn't convince me so much, because that's not why you bring Karbanos after a war. It's not a makeup for an, yeah. for an error. And it's not why like, like, many of the Karbanos are not like that. So I would read it the other way, which is to say that obedience is a prerequisite for a Karban. If you don't believe in me enough to follow my instructions, why do you think I want your Karban? Like, that's not, you know, a carbon is a function of relationship with God. It's a person saying, I value God so much, I want to show how much I love God, I'm going to give something of my own. And even if God doesn't need it, it's my gesture of generosity that matters to me. But if you can't even do what God told you to do, then what kind of message are you sending? It's like you want to bribe God? Is that what this is? Like, what, what's your, you know, what is your thinking here in, in doing this and then in pushing it? Right? Because he pushes. He says, you know, I, I did everything right. And even after Shmuel tells it to him, you know, he says, no, 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 we did, we did exactly what God said. You're, you're pushing forward. There's a Pasuk in Yirmiyahu in the second parak where he says, nishpat oscha, or osach, al amreich lo chatasi. He says, Hashem says to the Jews, I'm punishing you for saying I haven't done anything wrong. You know, the, um, because this was my bar mitzvah haftar, so, you know, my father drummed into me on this. You know how long it takes Shaul to actually say, I blew it? Mm-hmm. it you know, a clear and straightforward I blew it, because that takes a long time mm-hmm. in this, uh, to get to that point in this haftar. Look what happens next. Source number eight. Shaul says to Shmuel, Chatasi, right? So he has gone through being told, you know, wait, why do I hear sheep? And then Shmuel trying again and saying, you know, you're the head of the tribes of Israel. And then Shaul interrupted him. And then Shmuel came back to him a third time, saying, God doesn't want your carbonos. He wants you to listen. And he's rejecting you as king for failing to listen, something that I want to come back to. But then Shaul gives you what I called here on the sheet, a partial concession. Yes, he says, Chatasi, I sinned. I violated God's word and your instructions, Shmuel, because I was afraid of the nation. Right? It's like when 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 people apologize for something, like I'm sorry, but right? Yeah. Like if you're really sorry, then I apologize. What I did was wrong, and stop talking. (laughs) Not I'm sorry, but the nation. And then, to make it worse, he has has something he wants from Shmuel. He says, accept my sin, come back with me, I will daven to Hashem, and then it will all be good. We'll daven together. At which point, Shmuel says, you don't get it. I'm not going back with you. (laughs) You've rejected God's word. And then there's an interlude in between sources 8 and 9, with a tearing of a cloak, unclear whose cloak it is, and a statement that this cannot be undone. You You are done as king. And eventually, eventually, you get to a chatasi, to an Isin by Shmuel, and then you get source number nine. It's so babyish sounding. Yeah. He, he's telling you he made a mistake, and he's just not, no, 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 no. Like, Unless the answer is, he really genuinely believed it was right. right. But he's a nubby. Like, if, if, yeah. It doesn't matter what you believe. Okay, you made a mistake. You believe something, but it was Right, wrong. so that's not something that I'm going to get to in this year. You really enjoy the Thursday afternoon one because that's one of the issues that I am discussing there. Is does he think Shmuel misunderstood God? Right. Along with the question of well, why isn't Shuba possible? Forget about Shuba. Kill the guy. Just do it right now. That, and that's, that's part of Shuba, right? Well, no. Because we, we have, that we will talk about. That we are going to get to. Why not just kill him right now? But the um, but how does Shmuel know that you can't do Shuba? Maybe you can. Well, Shmuel was operating the whole night teaching God, right? So that so may like, be an answer. Shmuel already knows that God said no. There's, I, there, there's more to it. But let's see this. Number nine, because finally a guy is going to die. But not at Shmuel's hand. 
Shmuel says, bring me Agag, king of Amalek. Agag is brought out to him. And Agag says, now there are two different ways to, there are three different ways to read this. Achein sar mar hamaves. They translated here, bitter death is at hand. The word sar usually means something has gone away. But Rashi and others take it as, no, it has drawn it near. In other words, bitter death is at hand. He understands he's about to be executed. Right. Right. There are others who take it differently, and I'm going to read it differently in a, in a moment. But Shmuel says, as your sword made women bereft, so too that's going to happen to your mother now. And Shmuel takes his sword and <laughs> chops him down. So my questions on this, my four questions are these. Number one, why does Shaul spare Agag? Right? Why did he spare him in the first place? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Know. Number two, why doesn't Shmuel criticize Shaul for Agag once he finds out? He has two more speeches that we read after Shaul told him, and I brought Agag. And he never says anything to him about that. He talks about the animals. He doesn't talk about sparing Agag. Third, why is Shmuel the one to kill Agag? Why not let, as you've asked, let Shaul do it now? The, um, Shaul is going to continue to function as king for a while yet. So why not let Shaul be the one to, uh, to do it? And then finally, what's with the speech? Yeah. Right? Just kill him. Yeah. As you did this, and so shall be done. Like, it's very dramatic, but this isn't a movie. You know, just kill him and be done with it. So... In order to do this, in order to, to, to get some level of understanding here, we have to go back to the question, which we discussed last year, of why Amalek has special rules. Why is Amalek not like any other war? We, we don't have this concept. The laws of war within Torah do not allow for massacring everybody. They, they just don't. The whole thing doesn't fit. And we, we talked about that more you know, at length last year. And we gave three answers, which I'm just going to present in digest because, you know, that's a sheer in of itself. One answer was the personal character of Amalek. They have a certain cruelty, which if you look at number 10, that's the reading of Zahar, it's highlighted in Parshas Kitetzi when we're told, They attacked the weak. They ambush you out of nowhere. You're exhausted. And they attack the weak people who are at the back. At the back. That's number one. Number two, their relationship with God. Emphasized by the description in number 10 of below Yarei Elohim, that they are not God-fearing, and in fact, Hashem makes it a personal war between himself and Amalek, and they have to be destroyed. Mitachad Hashemayim, from beneath the heavens. It's Hashem's war from generation to generation. Ibn Ezra points it out, that I brought it for you in number 11, about how everybody was afraid of us, and Amalek comes out to strike in order to keep people from fearing uh, from fearing God. He does not fear God and he is going to diffuse the fear of God. Menders discusses that at much greater length. And so the second approach is their relationship with God. And then the third approach is it's their hatred for us. The fact that you see, as I brought you in number 12, this ongoing battle between Amalek and us. The fact that Amalek himself, as in the original Amalek, is the grandson of Esav, right? It's Amalek, son of Eliphaz, son of Esav. And the, uh, the other side of it, the uh, Esav's uh, consort in this, was Timnah. And Timnah, if you remember, we had this whole discussion, is described as a Pelagesh mm-hmm. of Eliphaz. She's not Esav, sorry, she's Eliphaz's consort. She's, um, but she is a concubine, which we said didn't make any sense, because Aluf Timna, she is apparently part of some royal family. And then Gemara has this whole story about how she actually wanted to convert to our family. It wasn't Judaism then, but she wanted to join the family of Avram Yitzhak Yaakov. They rejected her, and she said, fine, then I'll go marry to Esau's family instead. And there's this resentment that she passes along to Amalek. And so there's this the animosity. Mm-hmm. The Gemara in Sanhedrin, Sanitas, brings it and uses that as a basis for saying you have to be really careful, don't push people away. The, um, you push people away, look what you create. 
the the um, Abarbanel and Malvin bring all of these uh, explanations in one to one extent or another. But those are your three issues that make Amalek unique and that lead but to. This, but only in the Torah is it written this first that they the, the approached you from the behind. Yeah. That's only one reason. Yes, that's correct. Can I just ask something? Um, if if they were all destroyed, though, including Agag. And how did anything happen afterwards, right? So I am of the belief, which I, I talked about at length in, in the Thursday afternoon year, that this is not the last group of Amalek. Shmuel never says to Shaul, this is the last stronghold of Amalek. Remember that all of the tribes that they met when they came into the land had various cities. You have Amori cities. It's not like there's one city. So Amalek also had multiples. It has to be, because as you see in the timeline in number 12, in, in another 12 chapters, the, you're going to find that David is going to attack Amalek, and then Amalek is going to burn down the city of Ziklag. That story, if you follow a traditional chronology, is no more than two years after this event, and likely just several months, depending a little bit on when this occurs within Shaul's reign. But Shaul's reign, the classic chronology, is just a couple of years long. And this story with Ziklag happens before Shaul's death. So it doesn't make any sense. Granted, Abarbanel and Rabban give you a longer timeline for Shaul. They say it could have been a couple of decades that he was king. But even still, how, like, out of, out of what did this happen? Agag is now dead. And there's a medrash that says that Agag actually, you know, somehow a woman is smuggled into Agag and she conceives that night and that, that baby is now, you know, the next one from, uh, from Amalek. But even still, Okay, so he grew, and what? And I, I'm going to take up Arbanel and Rabag and say that he had 18 years or so, and then he somehow was head of a Amalek nation. Like, it's very hard to sustain that view. And I recognize that what I'm saying is a little bit unique, that um, it's not what you normally hear about this, but I think it's Pshat. And I think that's got to be the straight read for the reason that you asked. The, um, but these three factors with Amalek, number one, the, their cruelty, number two, their relationship with God, and number three, their relationship with us, lead to special rules that are given to Shaul. Don't spare anybody. Don't take any spoils. And if you look at number 13, this is the Abarbanel that I quoted you before. He says, lest one think that this war was like other wars, to take spoils and take them as slaves, he ordered them to destroy all that Amalek had. This is also why it mentioned in Esther's day, Right in the yeah, so we get your Megillah and Marsha run. That Israel, when they avenged themselves upon their foes, did not touch the spoils. Right. The message is this isn't your normal uh, your normal war. But what, what would have been like just because we hate them more, we want to eliminate them? What's wrong with spoils? Because it says that this isn't a war it's about God. Heaven. This isn't this isn't a divine instruction. Even it's just this is what nations do with other nations. They you know certainly in that period of history, they all went to war against each other. And they took whatever they got. Now you're saying, I don't want anything for this. Just get rid of them. Just get rid of them. Like, well, also because it makes us more above other nations, right? Because we don't attack like that on a regular basis. We don't, what, like, that was like a massacre. I mean, it's certainly like it, that, right? This so is So it's kind of thing, like, there's, ten, there's strenuous circumstances for this war, so much so that we're not celebrating the same way we would a different war, because yes. we're above... This kind this of isn't, this isn't killing violence. The, um, right. And now we understand that with the spoils, Shaul has violated the tariffs. Because even if you're holding them for carbonos, those are spoils. You're taking it for your use. And Shmuel says that to Shaul. He says, Vatato HaShalal. You swoop down on those spoils. And now, now that we know that, we can come back to the question about Agag and why he spared Agag. Does, mm, yeah. Does, does um, Shaul's issue of thinking he's like a lay person affect his decision of being maybe too petrified to touch Agag? Oh, you think it's fear, maybe? That's interesting. Never thought about it as a fear and possibility. Blaming the nation, he like reverts into this character where he's the weaker one. Interesting. And he truly felt wow. he couldn't do it. I have to admit, not having thought about it that way, I find it difficult to think of, of it that way. Meaning, again, you wiped out everybody else. You just stop it. It's easier to kill. Yeah. It's just, it's not like it's and, and, and children. 
But he's got him as a captive. It's not like he, it's not like Agag is invulnerable. Shmuel's going to kill him. You know? Or maybe he's, he's like he's the king. This is the king. They have the same position. Right. So that that's what Goldie is suggesting is what I've heard more routinely suggested is that well you know it's king and king type of a thing some element of sympathy you know maybe he sees himself and thinks that could be me um, but let me let me show you Malvin because I think what Malvin does with this is brilliant you know Malvin he loves language there are no synonyms to Malvin every word is unique so he tackles the fact that we have three different words that we use for sparing someone we have rachamim. Right? Mercy is what we usually render that. We have chemla, vayachmol, as it's used here. And then there's the word lachus. Right? Lachus as well. Chus v'rachim, you know, that kind of thing. So what Malvin says is rachamim is an emotional connection that one person has for another. That's the way to read rachamim. He says lachus is also an emotional connection, but it's a connection born out of necessity. I could use this. I don't want to get rid of it. It would be useful to me. But it's still an emotional type of a, of a reaction. You feel an association with something. Chemla, he says, is intellectual. Chemla is, I don't think this should be destroyed. That's the, that's the way he takes chemla. And he says, if you go back to the original instructions given to Shaul, he says, Velo sachmol alav. He doesn't say lo tachus. He doesn't say lo tarachim. You can't command someone don't have an emotional reaction. You can't say to him, don't have mercy on, on them. You could say, don't spare them. Don't decide that you're going to spare them. The problem, as Malvim understands it, with what Shaul does is that he makes an intellectual decision to disobey. It's not mercy. I go back here to Miriam's point from before. You can't tell me that this was mercy and he killed all the children. That just doesn't make any sense. The, the, um, it fits his error regarding the Karbanot back in chapter 13 when he was supposed to wait for Shmuel and he said, well, the Plishtim are attacking. I need to bring Karban before the war. I better bring it now. The, um, it's a calculated decision. But at least there he had the excuse of real pressure. The Plishtim are massing on my border. They're about to attack. Whereas here, it's well, the nation kind of pushed me into, into doing this. As though the, yeah, the nation is the driving force, especially regarding Agag. Like you can imagine the Jews rallying like, no, spare Agag, spare Agag. Come on. Mm-hmm. Seriously? No, but but it's, what you're basically saying is that he must have had a reason. He does have a reason, which is, which is what we're going to get to. But I want to first note something else for you. Rav Amnon Bazak points this out, and I think he's entirely right. Go back to Pasuk Tet. It's the end of source number two. Vayachmol Shaul v'ha'am al agag v'al meitav tzon bakar, etc. He notes Shaul spared Agag, the nation spared the animals. That's the way he reads it, which makes a lot of sense, because first of all, why would the nation be arguing to spare Agag? But also, when Shaul makes the point, the nation pushed me, the nation pushed me, he only does it regarding the Karbanos. He doesn't do it regarding Agag. He never justifies what he did with Agag. So I thought that was a very good read that uh, the Rabbi Zak was providing here for it, and it helps us understand the decision-making process regarding Agag. What Radak says, I think it's Radak, definitely a Barbanel, as you'll see on the sheet, and Rabazak says this as well, is that Shaul was actually trying to live up to the mission of destroying Amalek when he took Agag back to the camp. He had no special instructions about how Agag should die. He was just told, wipe them all out. There were no special, like, oh, and Agag, make sure to do X. He was told to destroy all the animals. He wasn't told how to destroy Agag. Shaul was trying to do what kings often do in Tanakh. When you capture the opposing king, you disgrace him. He becomes a trophy. Remember, Shaul himself was afraid that that would happen to him when he was captured by the Plishtim. The, um, if you go back to Yehoshua and Shoftim, the story about Doni Bezek, the king of Yerushalayim, who they capture him and they cut off his, big, his thumb and his big toe. And you look at it and think like, we did that? What was that about? And then you find out. He says, 
I did this to 70 kings myself, and God arranged for this to be done to me. The, um, that's the only best ex- uh, um, acknowledgement and, and acceptance of it. This was routine back in the day. If you look at a Barbanel, I wrote it for you in number 15. He said, Shaul said, he had done as kings do, bringing a god, king of Amalek, alive in order to mock him. And I go back to what Nehemiah had said before, right? And again, he also said something similar to it. He's parading him around. The, um, he's, he's taking him on a trip. He brought him back alive in order to mock him. I destroyed them all. Like, that's what kings do. They destroy the nation, and then they, they bring their kings in ropes of suffering. Iron, as the story with, uh, with Adoni Bezek. So he just didn't understand that when Hashem said, do not leave anyone alive, that that really well, he, he, he wasn't was leaving him alive. He was planning on killing him. Planning on killing him. Yeah. Yeah. He spoke too soon. He Why couldn't he kill him too early? early. Yeah. Yeah. Just give him a little bit more time. Yeah. Then, don't rush to it. So that, I think, is why Shemuel doesn't criticize him for it. And also, why is Shaul did it not clear? Shaul on. Hang on, let me, let me just let me finish the thought. He, he knocks Shaul for the animals. He knocks Shaul for claiming to follow the nation's will. He doesn't say anything about saving Agag, even though he had two chances to include it in his comments. Because Shaul did fulfill the instructions. This is not Shaul's big mistake. The, um, he just did it the wrong way. It is disobedience. I, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. The Gemara in Yuma says that he loses the throne because of the incident with Agan. But from Shaul's perspective, on this score, he doesn't believe he's being, he doesn't realize he's being disobedient. He's just messed up. He messed up what was supposed to happen. And now we understand why Shmuel has to be the one to kill Agag himself. If Shaul kills Agag now, then what does it lose the kingship. No, what does it look like? It looks like he was wrong. What, what, what does it look like to the outside observer? Not to Shmuel, not to... What does it look like if Shaul kills Agag now? That that's what God intended, including the mockery. The including the mockery. This is just like any, any other, other war. Plan. It's like any other war. The point was not that Agag should die. It was how he should die. He has to die in a circumstance that makes it clear. This isn't a war of conquest. This isn't a war of enrichment. And you would have done that if it happened that he died in a war where they didn't take spoils and they didn't parade him as a trophy. Now Shmuel is going to be the, the one to do it. Not the conquering king, but the religious prophet. Now it's an act of God instead. And maybe that's why Shmuel gives his speech first. It's a speech of righteous indignation. It's a speech of divine justice. It speaks to the original explanations of why Amalek is different. Their character, their relationship with God, you know, they, they're, they're different. You can even make it as their relationship with us if the women that he's describing are, are ours. The, um, but now I'll show you what I have on the back page. This I, I saw the other day and I thought, wow, they, uh, this is incredible. Uh, Bazak mentions it in his article, but you can find it online. Um, I found the original you know, picture here. What you see there, the typed part, is Eichmann's wife's petition for clemency for Eichmann. I didn't look up the German to translate it, but I understand that it is. We have. We have. Oh, okay, so you tell me. I understood that it was uh, because he has a family. Was yeah, it? he has a wife and a, and a mother. The wife and the wife is a mother of four kids, so please spare the life. Right. So you see what Yitzhak Ben Svi, the president of Israel at the time, writes on the, uh, on the note here. Right? He quotes this Pasuk. He quotes what Shmuel said. He says, Kasher shimcharbecha, hashem himecha. As you did to women, so shall be done to, uh, to your mother. He mentioned to Dr. Nurak, who had also, uh, who had made this point, and, uh, clemency denied. That's amazing. Which, uh, he says after, um, denying, I guess, I guess somebody already petitioned. <laughs> so after denying the petition, so you're the, the lot of my husband is in your hands. So I'm asking you as a mother, as, as his wife and as mother of four kids, to spare the life of my husband. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. this is what, and like you could hear those words resonate where there is an SS standing with a gun and the right. mother is pleading. Yeah. I just watched the movie. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's after the obvious, right? Yeah. You know? And Vera is the right wife. Is so yeah. I love that the president makes his decisions with both Yes. I know, right? Those were the days. Awesome. Yeah. I know. Those, those were the days. Who is this? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's amazing. I never... So the question after all of this, I mean, what we've done basically, I think, is to get an understanding of the story and of the Haftarah, which is good. Um, but what do you take from this? So part of it is we now have a better understanding of a parak in Tanakh, and I think that in and of itself has value. Um, I think it also is a message about the job of the monarch to set a tone of following the divine instruction, and as Kana noted, he disobeyed. Now he loses the throne. The whole establishment of a throne is only legitimate in Judaism if the monarch takes his orders from the Navi and from Hashem. The moment he stops doing that, it's like sorcery and resorting to foreign, go- to, to foreign gods. So that's a message in terms of the leadership. It's also a message, I think, you know, in general for people to understand that second-guessing God is a, is a dangerous game. Right? You think you know better, you, you don't know better. But it's also, I think, a message regarding Amalek, that it's possible for there to be an enemy who is so cruel, <coughs> excuse me, and so awful, that all the rules go out the window. And you need a Navi to say that. I mean, that's not something that you can just say. I think they're so terrible. ISIS is so terrible that whatever. Like, you have to be really, really careful about what you do with this. Um, but it's possible that you reach a point where, indeed, all the rules go out the uh, go out the window, and that's what was supposed to happen here. Not going to show this isn't a routine okay. case. This is this is unusual. So I gave you review questions at the end. What was Shol Zavera as expressed in Bayach Mol? Some of them says it's the disobedience and not the uh, and not um, you know not mercy, um, and perhaps it's specifically the yeah intellectually, and perhaps it's specifically the Agag part, the nation sparing the sheep, but it's Shaul sparing Agag, making the decision that this is the way to do it. Um, Shmuel doesn't criticize Shaul for sparing Agag at first because he doesn't know, um, but afterwards because I think it really could have been. I'm trying to do the command. I just did it the wrong way. Um, and I'm still, you can probably tell, on the fence about whether Shaul should be held responsible then, because he really thought he was doing what, what, what Hashem wanted him to do. So you think he's really just being punished for letting the people come in to keep the spoils? I think that, plus... The way he went about it, the, he should have just killed The him. whole parading thing, I think... Yeah. I think there is an expectation that Shaul is supposed to be aware that that's not, what's, that's not, what, what, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. But does obedience mean without question? Because I feel like this was so avoidable if Shmuel would have just been clear and told him straight out, why couldn't they have a conversation and Shmuel say to him, this is not like any other war. Kill him A, B, and C. Why was there so many... It sounds like Shaul didn't really know how he was basic. supposed to kill, kill them. He, did, he thought he was doing the right thing. Why um, couldn't it be clearer? Unless the answer is because you have twice in the Torah the command about destroying Amalek, making clear that they are unique. They have a special, they're singled out, a war from God and so on. And then you have, in the language of Shmuel's instruction, in the language we've never seen with any other war, they've been in the land at this point for 400 plus years. They have fought a lot of wars. They've never been told to do this. I think there is a sense of, right. like, I told you, this is different. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the way I would, I would read it. Yeah. Um, we said the war has special rules because of their own character, their relationship with God, and their hatred across generations for us. Um, and Shmuel kills Agag, I think, to make it a religious act of divine justice which could have happened if it had been in a war where no spoils are taken, but the moment you lose that context, Shmuel has to reiterate it by doing this at the end. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit speculative, but I think that there's a lot of basis for, uh, for that, that way to explain it. And are we also, are, could we say that this punishment was worse than maybe more than we would have expected um, because he's the first king and was sort of like, you know, setting the tone for kings? Like... Right, so I've seen that suggestion that maybe, in general, not about this per se, but in general, that, uh, that that's so. Abar Benel has a fascinating take at the end of this parak. He wants to know why it is that Shaul um, has no possibility of making it back, no possibility of tshuva, whereas David gets the opportunity to do tshuva. And he gives different explanations. But the route that he ends up going for this is different. The, um, the route that... that that he ends up going is that Shaul is, Shaul's mistakes are royal mistakes. They're about functioning as a king. David's mistakes are personal. They're about personal flaws. Personal flaws, you messed up. Tshuva's going to be hard, but you can do tshuva. 
if you mess up as king, there, there's no making that up. It's in front of the entire nation. You misled a nation. You don't get the chance to try to set that right. So that's his that's conclusion. Kind of thing, like yeah. Although Kong Gadol can bring a carbon for a wrong thing. It's more like a say-head kind of thing. Right? Doesn't the Kong Gadol die if he... On your kids come back. Yeah. If he... That's the wrong thing in the Kodesh. It's communal more, not... Yeah. And, and the, the relationship with God, does Hashem really care, or is it more that it's just like how it appears to the world? Because why would that be like a whole reason? Mm-hmm. Maybe because of the impact on the world. Yeah. And that doesn't, it wouldn't bother me to say that that's because of the impact on the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.